You know, they used to say, if that was for me, it's too much. But if that was for the Lord, it's not enough. Let's give the Lord some praise. Oh, I'm not going to remind you what he's already done. I'm not going to talk to you. nickname is the big V so now you know the secret is out let's pray father I thank you I thank you for the gift of this day and I thank you for what you have set before us life blessings Lord I thank you for this time where we come to share your word Holy Ghost we need you to preach to us today Lord there are anointed preachers in this house and in this world and I come to declare I ain't trying to be none of them Father help me to be the daughter that you can entrust with what you've said to say it how you say it to whom you say it the right way without any glory to me but that points everyone to you thank you in Jesus name Amen. All right. So now, we have been, you all know, I'm a Sunday school teacher at heart. So everything has to have a context. Here's a context. If you look on the door, you'll see coming attractions. Like in the movies, coming attractions. And so far, we have heard rest is a coming attraction. Some of us who are performance oriented, we got permission to stop performing and rest in God. Then we also heard about balance. That all of this, these, these trying to please people and doing things that, that make sense to our natural mind, but don't really make sense from God's perspective, we can lay them down, get some balance. And then... Sean Peter Dalcor. Okay. Oh, y'all didn't know that was his middle name. Okay. Came and preached on <laughs> increase in your bloodline. And he talked about Joseph. So in the coming attractions, we see we're going to rest. There's balanced and there's increase. Shouting. Shouting places, right? Then here come me. Because when we talk about, in fact, when we talk about the coming attractions to your story, this is the other part of the context. Is the, These are the people online. Okay, let me tell you something about a story. See, I'm learning how to do this. In the movies, in any good stories, there is a protagonist and an antagonist. I might have some people who've been in plays who know something about that. The protagonist is the star of the story. And many of us are living out stories where we're not even a protagonist. We're living out somebody else's story, but I, I digress. <laughs> so in the protagonist, the protagonist, the star of the story, he's got a journey. The movie starts setting up the main character. That's the protagonist. But the antagonist in the story is designed to confront the protagonist and make getting to the end of it hard. Let me, let me give you a story that you don't want to hear. Once upon a time, there was a princess. She married a prince and they lived happily ever after. The end. That's a lousy story, isn't it? 
Because every good story has to have an ingredient that we don't like to talk about. It's the part that makes your stomach knot up when you're in the movie. When you hear a sound, when you hear a character do something, you know what's happening. And that element is called conflict. You cannot have a good story without conflict. So in the coming attractions, while we're talking about rest and balance and increase, know that there's going to be conflict. So let's go back and reintroduce ourselves to Joseph. I am in Genesis, the 37th chapter, and I'm starting with verse 1. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family, family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Now, you know, that's typically when we start talking about how mean family can be. But that's not where we're going today. Verse 5. Joseph had a dream. Simple paragraph. Joseph had a dream. And Elder Callie used to say, when you see something in there, you need to see what it's there for. Joseph had a dream. Now, let me tell you something about dreams. Your dream is what God has given you, and it will mark you. It will put a target on your back. Because your dream is what God has given you to solve a problem in the earth. Think about that for a minute. There are some other people in Genesis who had dreams. See, God speaks to us in dreams if we're paying attention. Abimelech had a dream. (laughs) Abimelech had a dream because he was getting ready to get with Sarah, Abram's wife. Because Abraham was scared. So he told, tell him you're my sister. Don't tell him you're my wife. So Abimelech said, oh, okay, come live with me. He had a dream. God said, you'll die if you touch her. She's another man's life, wife. Sometimes we have dreams from God that warn us. The Lord put that in there because he wants us to understand the significance of those dreams. But you know what? Jacob had a dream too. When he was leaving and coming back to meet his brother Esau, the Bible says he laid down, laid his head on a rock and went to sleep. And he saw the angels coming, descending and ascending is what the Bible said. So dreaming was in Joseph's bloodline. We talk so much about generational curses that we forget that there are some generational blessings. There are some things in your family. That's why you need to know who's in your family and allow the Lord to show them to you from a different perspective. So Joseph had a dream. It wasn't just the favor from his father that put Joseph at odds with his brother, but it was that dream. Let me prove it to you. Let's go to the 19th verse right there. This is the response of Joseph, and we, everybody know what the dream is. The sheaves are going to bow down to you. We've talked about that. But I want to talk about the response to your dreams. In the 19th verse, what does it say? Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. But listen to the last line. Then we'll see what happens to his dream. Your dream, what God has put in you, and y'all know me, I talk about dreams all of the time. I'm going to keep talking about them until I stop dreaming. Your dreams that God has put in you are for the benefit of the world. But we have been taught to disdain our dreams. So this title of this message is the conflict 
in your story. Yeah, you got a story. You got some coming attractions. You have some things happening, but you also have some conflicts. Let's talk about where the conflicts are going to come from. The first place, <laughs> I told him I wasn't going to need this. <laughs> the first place of conflict comes from your family of origin. Uh-huh, yeah. We all grew up in a family. And just in case you didn't know, there are no perfect families. Not now one, as my father used to say. So if we look at our families, let's look at what was in Joseph. Because Joseph had a dream. And we're going to get to the point of that dream. But let's look at where the conflicts to your dreams are going to come from. In your family of, of origin, if we look at Genesis 27, 6 through 18, we know that playing favorites in the family was okay. Not only did Jacob play favorites with Joseph, but Jacob's mama played favorites with him. Come here, Esau. Esau was the firstborn son who was supposed to get the blessings, but mama had a little trickster in her. And what she said is, come here, Jacob. I'm getting ready to show you how to trick your daddy out of the blessing. I'm going to make what he likes to eat. We're going to put some hairy stuff on you so that since he can't see that well, when you go to him, you're going to get the blessing. So playing favorites wasn't new. It was in the family. Deception was also in the family. We're talking about Joseph. Listen, let me tell you, those same brothers who loved their father so much sold their brothers, and then had the nerve to come back and comfort him. <laughs> oh, Lord, our father's mourning. We told him he's dead, so let's comfort him. Deception was in the family. That whole thing was about deception. But what else was in the family? Because we're telling you where the conflicts to your story is going to come from. Mistreatment and misuse of women was in the family. Genesis 35. Jacob's oldest son, Reuben, had sex with one of his daddy's concubines. Meanwhile, in Genesis 38, big brother Judah, y'all remember him, seen Judah first. I'm not saying, <laughs> I'm not saying that Judah wasn't anointed, but he had to be tricked into keeping a vow that he made to his daughter-in-law. So mistreatment of women and this kind of misuse, it was in the family. Murder was okay in the family, too. We're talking about where your conflict is going to come from. You all remember in the movie, The Ten Commandments, when Moses, he was like, Levi's, who is on the Lord's side? And the Levi's ran, and they killed everybody who had been disobedient. Well, they didn't stop killing then either, because... In Genesis, the 34th chapter, and I'm giving you these verses because sometimes we look at the characters in the Bible as perfect people. That's what I love about the word of God. It shows you that there are imperfect characters that God can use, that God can anoint. So, Simeon and Levi, they had a sister named Dinah. And there was a king who looked at Dinah, wanted Dinah, and raped Dinah. So you know what these two brothers did? And then the king said, okay, I want to marry her. I want to marry her. And Simeon and Levi said, okay, we can't allow our daughter to be married to a man who's not circumcised. So we want every man in the city to be circumcised. And the king and his daddy and his son agreed. And so every man in the city was circumcised. And while they were recuperating, those two jokers went in that town and killed every man. We're talking about what's in Joseph's family line. So, so lest we trip on Joseph, what's in your family? What's in your family? Because we know that you have been created with God, with purpose. And often it will come in the form of a dream. What's in your family? You know, when I was in the um, second grade, Miss Olson, she was not a nice lady. But 
there was a picture on the wall of ballerina dancers. And we had a class where they said, where do you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a ballerina dancer. And she told me, black girls can't be ballerinas. That's okay. That's okay. Because we got black ballerinas today, don't we? So Miss Olsen lied. So let's go back. When I talk about what's in your family and what's in your history, what were you told that you couldn't do? That you're still holding on to now? Some of us are 60 years old and still believe in the words of Miss Olsen's. Miss Olsen probably dead and gone, but I bet you she know it's some black ballerinas today. So what have you been told? What lie? Because we saw how the enemy used Joseph's brothers. Here come this dreamer. See, that was the voice of the adversary. I'm coming after the dream. Because after I kill him, let's see what happens to the dream. You ain't the target. The dream is. So what are you carrying that the enemy has been trying to talk you out of since you were a child? What's in you? Ask your neighbor, what's in me? What's in me? It's not you. It's the dream. Because in the dream is a solution. So, what's in your family? What is it that is in you that is fighting against what God has told you to do? Is it that? Oh, no. You trying that again? Uh-uh. Our family don't do that. You know, more of us are afraid of success than failure. We know lots of failures. We get comfortable in failure. We say nobody really expected it anyway. But success has a requirement that causes you to sacrifice yourself. That whole target that the dream put on your back when it comes to your family systems, you're going to have to do one of two things. You're going to have to choose the dysfunction or you're going to have to choose the dream. So, what's in your family? The mark and the weight of the dream on your life will separate you. Some of us, smart kids. I was a smart kid in school. Y'all know what they used to say to smart kids in school? Somebody said, nerd, look at you. This is a funny story. I'm going to tell you a funny story. <clears throat> Remember when Michael Jackson, the Jackson 5, first came out? And look, no, this was probably, we hadn't moved yet, so it was fifth grade. And they had, we used to always write the words to the songs down. Ooh, they was a nice song, you write the words down. And in the song, I'll Be There, I wrote the words, you and I must make a pact. We will bring salvation back. I went out for recess. Go on, sing, Ed Lawson. <laughs> I went out for recess, and I came back, and the kids were around my desk laughing because they thought I didn't know how to spell path because they thought Michael Jackson was saying, you and I must make a path. Because they didn't have the vocabulary to understand the word pact. How many of us have learned to dumb ourselves down because we have been around average, below average people and we don't want to be talked about. They didn't know the word packed, but thought I was the joke. And guess what? I didn't have the courage to figure that out until 15 years ago. Because do you know what happens? We take the ridicule of other people and we swallow it. And we make it all about us. And we call it true when the Lord is saying, that is a lie. Ah, but we have not become acquainted with the God who gives dreams. Your dream will get you in trouble. So that's the first area of conflict your, your, your conflict to your story is going to come from. It's going to come from 
your patterns in your families, the thing that you learned about yourself. But here's the second area of conflict that's going to fight you. Your environment. Your environment. Joseph was taken from his environment where they were shepherds. Remember, he said he used to work for his brothers and the flocks and he told and brothers got mad. Well, now he went to Egypt. That's the big city. That's a different way of behaving. Different language, different culture. And don't forget, he was only 17 years old. So now, think about this. You're in an environment that's not natural to you. How many of us have had to transfer and develop this place of being rejected and by ourselves because we in a territory and nobody else likes us? But let me just put this here. The Lord is trying to teach you how to take new territory. I was telling a lady yesterday, you don't become somebody who is assigned to new territory and don't have any scratches on your arm where you had to go to places where nobody has been before, where branches scratch you and your knees are scratched up and maybe you might limp a little bit. Come here, Jacob. So you get your second place of conflict from your environment. Some of us have been in environments where people don't succeed. Some of us have been in environments where it's common to talk about people. I hate gossip. Did I ever tell y'all that? I hate gossip. Some of us have normalized gossiping under the guise of prayer. That's how we spiritualize gossip. And so... When we talk about the environment you're in, and I'm looking at all of the people when they came here, and I felt loved, and all of that. See, that's a culture change. Okay, I'm getting ready to go just for a little bit into what I do for a living. What I do for a living is I help executives and companies develop ways so that their employees can be more productive. There's a saying that culture will eat your vision for lunch. That means the environment that you are in will undo every prayer, every plan. See, we're praying too much about what we want people to do rather than what we want the culture to look like. The environment that you are in will undo your stuff if you let it impact you. So the second place of your conflict is going to come from your environment. Who are you surrounded by? Who's your best friend? Do you look around and everybody is messy? Your environment will conflict your dreams. Not only was the environment different, but the language was different. What kind of thing do you talk about when ain't nobody listening? There's something that says, small-minded people, don't say nothing, just look straight ahead. <laughs> small-minded people, I'm going to talk to the people on the internet. Small-minded people talk about other people. The average person talks about stuff. Great minds talk about ideas. What is your conversation like? It's part of your environment. But this is a good thing about the environment. Because see, our stories were not written by us. There's somebody called the author and finisher who wrote our stories. And so I tell people when you find yourself in a really hard circumstance, and I hope y'all remind me of this if I ever get like that, that when you are in a tough circumstance, Pastor Ray, I'm going to look at Pastor Ray because he always say Michelle Aikens. So when you're in a tough circumstance, you have to remember that you are kingdom property. Everything that's happening to you is either ordained or allowed for part of your story. Ordained or allowed. And so what that means is there are some things that Joseph got in Egypt. He got 
in his 17 year old mind he got a knowledge of the culture and the norms and then he learned whether or not he was going to be true to his faith or not he learned how to develop see he had had dreams before but those dreams turned into vision when it was time for it when the king called for Joseph to interpret his dreams, he didn't just interpret his dream, but he gave him, I love when prophetic people say this, he gave him strategy. <laughs> See, some of us got a dream, we ain't got no strategy. One thing to have a dream, but what are you going to do with it? You learn that in your environment. So Egypt was the training ground for Joseph's strategic thinking. I want you to look at your environment that you're in and stop disdaining it, but get the lessons. Okay. So the first place conflict is going to come to your story is from your family of origin, and from that childhood stuff. The second place it's going to come from is your environment. But the third and the most critical place, and this is the place where it makes or break you, it comes from inside of you. Remember I was talking about the protagonist and the antagonist? The antagonist is the enemy to the story. The antagonist's job is to keep the story from happening. But when conflict comes from within you to your dream, you become the antagonist in your own story. You become the joker to your Batman. Let that settle for a minute. The antagonist in your story means that from within inside you is the fight that's coming against what God called you to do. In Genesis 40, Joseph had held up in prison. You know, he was taken as a slave, went to Potiphar's house, Potiphar's wife, and the Bible said he was a good-looking man. Those of you who are good-looking, stop trying to ugly yourself up so that other people will be comfortable. <laughs> Own your pretty. <laughs> Own your smart. Own it. Because it is part of what has been assigned to you. So the Bible said Joseph was a good-looking man. And good-looking men and women invite some stuff. This is an aside, not in nobody's notes. Decide now what you're going to do with the inappropriate attacks that come from just this. Decide now. The Bible said Daniel purposed in his heart before one lion had ever roared how he was going to serve God. Decide now how you're going to deal with the enemy that comes after you because it is. Okay? So, Joseph had held up in prison. He had interpreted dreams. He had prophesied. He encouraged. He told the ones he was with in prison. All he wanted was, just remember me. Just remember me. A lot of bad stuff happened to me. But when y'all get out, just remember me. Well, you remember me because you getting ready to get your head chopped off. But anyway, <clears throat> he was accurate. But it took two full years after they got out before somebody remembered. So now I got to ask you, what's your response when you prayed and prophesied and sold and shouted and nobody remembers. What's your response? See, this is where the conflict comes from inside of you. That's when the voices start to speak. They say, you weren't good enough anyway. God was never going to do that for you anyway. And so this stuff that happens inside of us is the thing that's going to destroy Destroy what God has given you. The Bible even says greater is he who's in you than he that's in the world. But if there's conflict within you about your dream, it will destroy you from the inside out. Let me show you how that works. Now, this is where. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. Norwood. Come here, Norwood. Young Norwood. <laughs> I don't even know who said that, but thank you. <laughs> Come here. 
Thank you. I want to do an exercise. Come here. Now, nah. put this over your face <laughs> and tie it in the back. Now, some of you all have seen me do this before, but I'm going to keep doing this until we get it. Okay. Can you see anything? Good. Okay. Now, this is what happens. Just so that, you know, okay, TTC students, lesson plan. Why do I need to know this? What are the facts? How does it work? This is how it works. Life comes along and the inner doubts start to hammer at you. And it turns you around and around and around in a circle. And you can't see what's happening. But the Lord promised you something. He gave you a dream. And so if your dream is over there, then he's saying, I walk with you, but sometimes I'm not going to talk. Elder Callie used to say, when it's test time, the teacher don't speak. So sometimes I'm not going to talk. I'm just going to lead you. But there are other times when it don't feel right. And you might jerk away from me. And you might jerk away from me. Because <laughs> this don't feel right. But then God, when you're ready, then I come back and I get you. And I lead you into the place of purpose. But Joseph had been in prison. He had been in prison and forgotten about. What about all those dreams about the sun and the moon bowing down to me? What about all of that other stuff? It doesn't seem like it's going to happen. Along the way, there's a baker and then somebody else. And, and I prophesied to them. But nothing, nothing, it seems like is happening. In spite of all the prayers, all the prophesying, every time the church doors open, I'm here. I've given. They told me to give, and I did, but nothing happened. And I still don't see nothing. Nothing. But then you all told me there are some coming attractions. What is this conflict? It's part of the story. Because you can't have a good story. Yeah, it was good when it came off, wasn't it? Yeah, you can see. Because Joseph's dream wasn't about getting along with his brothers. But it was about being the salvation for his brothers. See, God gave Joseph a dream, but your dream doesn't protect you from heartache. Your dream ain't going to protect you from people not liking you. Your dream ain't going to protect you from there not being lack. But you still have to keep the dream huh? if you're going to serve the Lord. If you're going to serve the Lord. Thank you. If you're going to serve the Lord. Because see, this is the issue. This is the real issue. We can entertain our dreams, but when the Lord says, I want you to keep going in spite of how it looks, I know a little bit about that. Uh, in spite of how it looks, we want to say, well, that wasn't the right dream. I quit. <sighs> so, to illustrate the conflict, because common sense learners need to see how it works. So that's what that little walk was. But some of you all might not. And I had to think about a character that really had a conflict. Watch this clip. We're going to illustrate what conflicts look like. You're a good man with a good heart. And it's hard for a good man to be king. I want to be He said it's hard for a good man to be king. Here's the, here's the conflict. I want to be great. I want to exalt you. I want to fulfill this dream. But I live in a world where there are conflicts. There are people who are telling me that I can't be a ballerina. Or that I can't spell words right. There are people who are telling me that I'm not smart enough for this. I'm not good enough for this. So I got a conflict because sometimes I believe them. But now let me tell you about plot twists. 
plot twists are the things that happen in a movie that nobody expected. And when you see a plot twist, you think, oh, Lord, this character is done. But the plot twist is actually designed to bring the character exactly to where he was supposed to be. Let's fast forward. Joseph needed to be in Egypt because famine was coming to Canaan. God had prophesied already <laughs> that Joseph was going, that he was going to provide a solution. Solution. Say solution. solution. It came in the form of a dream. He was going to provide a solution to what was coming to his people. See, a lot of times we get angry because we don't have the ability to see what's coming. But God does. He knew famine was coming to Canaan, so he had Joseph put in Egypt. And he had just the right amount of experiences that would develop not only his dream interpretation skills, but also his strategic skills. In the meantime, he was going to grow up because he needed to be of a certain age to be taken seriously, to be second in command to the Pharaoh. So all of these things are a part of the plot twist that leads to your story. But just in case you think, well, we're not supposed to have no conflicts in the New Testament. That's the Old Testament. I want to direct you to Romans. We, we almost finished. We talk about conflicts. Romans 7 chapter. 21 through 25. We want to talk about a conflict. Somebody say, what it say? <laughs> so I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner, inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work with me. Let me tell you something. Those things, those family systems, those, um, mm, do I hear music? Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, I would get with the music, but those family systems, those, those environments, those things that come against you, that conflict with your dream. God ain't surprised by that. Paul talked about it in Romans. But, and this is where we're going to close. There is also something, I think there's an actor in the house called a log line. And the log line is just a brief, like a sentence or two, that tells you what the whole story is about. Let me read you the log line. Romans, 8th chapter, 18th verse. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation, see that's normally where we shout, but listen to this. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. The children of God just don't get revealed. They just pop up. Uh-uh. They come through Egypt. They come through family systems. They come through environments. They come through. They're anointed to do some things in hard places. So creation is waiting for you to be revealed for real. Not the you that shows up on Sunday. The you that shows up in prayer. Because see, that's when the work is being done. When you are in your prayer closet, that's really when the work is being done. This here, this is just a result of the real work. And so anyway, the creation, the glory awaits, the creation awaits an eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Why? Because God is talking about the creation. And I looked, at, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. What are you saying, Michelle Akins? If you look at that passage, it points back to Genesis 3, 17 through 20. When creation got to suffer along with the judgment of man. Creation has been groaning ever since. Waiting for you to be revealed. And it happens when you dream. And you dare to trust that dream. And follow the God who gave it. There's a revelation coming. So part 
of your coming coming attractions is the revelation of you you have been put here to address a problem in creation this ain't just about coming to church on Sunday this is about the world God created and your place in it hold your head up stop disdaining your dreams stop shrinking back to make dumb people feel smarter go and do what God has told you to do because creation is waiting for you God bless you to go <laughs> this word was for me I got so much inside of me but sometimes I feel like I want to I want to make others feel comfortable and I dummy it down to make everybody else feel good but I know there's so much more that I see, I see so much. Make everybody else feel good. Let me do it this way. Wednesday night, I told my leaders this morning on the huddle, I'm sitting there in front of Donald Lawrence, I'm sitting there in front of William Murphy who wrote Praise Is What I Do, and I'm sitting in front of Jonathan McRunners, I'm sitting in front of all these great people in Chicago. I'm, sitting here and people have experienced five records from this church that were prophetic songs and I'm trying to say well let me let me make sure they they know that we got that too God said stop trying to make them feel good and do what I've called you to do And Phil, Phil Tarver yesterday just released me yesterday. He said somebody in the audience when I walked up to the stage and Shekinah Glory was standing there on the side, he said, somebody leaned over to him and said, man, they got some big shoes to fill. And he said he looked at my shoes and said, no, he ain't got no big shoes to fill. He got new shoes. And somebody in the room needs to know you got new shoes. You ain't got to be nobody else. You ain't got to do it like nobody else. But we coming out of that place. We're going to a land flowing with milk and honey. Just touch three people. Say, I decree milk and honey. I decree new milk, new honey. I decree it on SGM. I decree it on the minstrels. I decree it on the kar karate dancers. I decree it on the intercessors, the prophetic team, the doorkeepers. I decree new. Somebody just tap a neighbor in the room and say, see it like he said it. You blessed this house today. You didn't have to holler. You didn't have to scream. You blessed this house today. So real quick, I just want you to pray for the dreamer that's out there, that's going through their own level of conflict. Give them strength through prayer. Before I pray, I want some of, because the thing about the dreams is a lot of us keep them under wraps. Find a way to acknowledge the dream, maybe by coming forward. Because some of our dreams have been secret. We haven't told anybody about them. If you are a dreamer, if you got a dream, 
prophecy, part of his declaring it. I hear God saying as you come, there's some 60 and 70 year old dreamers that you think that God has shut your dream down because of your age. God said, make room. Come on the steps. Come up here if you can. He wants the dreamers. No matter your age, if you're available, he say, I got a dream for you. So I don't care how young you are. You can be Cairo's age, five years old. But you've got a dream. Get your but up here we talking to folks pastor sabrina that's online we want to let you know that's online get right dab smack in the midst of your device and touch your device say i got a dream i don't care how old you are i don't care how young you are god has something designed for you to help this earth be a better version of itself and I speak prophetically to SGM. This is your season. 23 years ago, it was their season. It's your season now. Fly, young man, fly. Young leaders, dad, fly, flourish. That's why I brought you up here. Fly. Fly, fly, fly. I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. Think about it every night and day. Spread my wings, spread your wings, spread your wings, spread your wings, spread your wings and fly away. Spread your wings and fly, fly, fly. Fly, 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 fly. Some of you need to be encouraged to fly. Somebody told you you can't fly. Somebody tried to dummy you down. They tried to take your wings off. But you can fly, fly. Fly like an eagle. Fly, fly, fly. I can fly. I can fly. I can fly. I can do. I can do. I can be. I can see. I can fly. Hey. There are miracles inside of me. There are miracles. There are miracles. Miracles, signs, and wonder. But first I know it starts inside of me. It starts inside of me. I can fly. I can do it. Why do you know you can do it, baby? Because I can do all things through Christ. I can do all, all things to Christ because he's going to give me strength like he gave Joseph strength. He gave him strength. He gave you strength in your weakness. His strength is being made perfect. I can fly. Hey. Good God Almighty, somebody in the room needs to know you can do it. Whatever he said, go be great, go be great, go be great, go be great, go, 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 go. Let's go, let's grow. I can fly. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. I thank you, God, that we can declare in the presence of these your people that every dream in every belly will come to pass. Father, we're no longer warring against what you told us to do. We're no longer warring against the dream inside of us. Lord, we declared it, but now we mean it. We take you at your word. Father, I thank you that your dreams don't expire. I look at every gray head in this house and I say, rise up. There are solutions in you. I thank you that you are wiser than you've ever been. You are smarter than you've ever been. I thank you that you are anointed. I thank you, oh God, from the oldest to the youngest, that every dream in this house has value. I thank you that we are a house that makes room for dreams. We make rooms for solutions because we agree that creation is crying out for us. Father, I come against the fears that were planted in childhood. You can't. 
you ain't. I come against them as what they are. I call them what you call them. They are lies. They are lies. They are lies from the pit of hell. And we lift up your truth. That creation is groaning in expectation of you. Of you, Marty. Of you, sis. Of you, Ken. Of you, Rhonda. Of you, Pastor Ray. Creation is groaning because it's waiting for you. Lord, I thank you. We care more about you than our own fears. We care more about you than our own comfort. We declare it this day that we will walk how you told us to walk. Say how you told us to say it. And be all that you've anointed us to be in Jesus' name. Amen.